Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining. We'll get started in just another few minutes um, with the workshop. Okay, I think we can get started. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Martin. Uh, I'm a lead solutions architect here at SmartBear, based out of Melbourne. And today I'm going to be working through a, a flow when we're talking about collaborating across the API lifecycle, uh, focusing on setting up an API workflow that scales. Um, so, I did do a talk around Open API specification uh, yesterday. Um, we are going to take some of the points from that and apply them to the, the workshop today. Um, it is interactive, so again, there is the, the chat function there as well. So if you have any kind of questions, I'll be monitoring them on the other screen uh, as of now. And um, yeah, I hope, hope you enjoyed the session. Just have maybe two or three slides to go through first, and we'll jump into the actual um, flow. Okay, just a, a quick bit about SmartBear. You might have heard of us, you might have not heard of us. Um, so some find it an interesting name. And then also some find my background wall uh, planned or not planned as well, so um, it's funny. <laughs> okay, so um, look, SmartBear was founded in 2009, 12 global offices, including um, our APAC headquarters in Melbourne. Um, so I'm based in Melbourne here with the team. Uh, I run the um, engineering and architecture team here for the APAC region. Um, one thing I do, do want to point out is we are across three open source initiatives. So we are the uh, vendor behind the Swagger tooling um, and also the SOAP UI tooling in terms of open source um, as well. And then also Cucumber. Uh, so we just acquired Cucumber uh, most recently last year as well. 
Okay, so I talked a small bit yesterday about where definitions uh, touch across different phases of the um, API lifecycle. So we talked a bit about, okay, taking that definition and then being able to, you know, apply that to a design perspective and maybe collaborate across that. Also documentation, which is extremely important if we're talking about, you know, applying this to a developer portal um, and, you know, just having a go-to guide as such also talked about virtualization and again we'll apply that today as well so virtualizing that api focusing on a definition driven development treating our api as the you know the front passenger um, essentially everything is going to be built around that initial phase of the api when we talk about a definition definition driven approach um, and then we're also talking a bit about parallel development so we have a team uh, structuring API design and documentation. We also may have front-end developers who want to start actively working on um, the API front-end development, applying that to particular clients. And then we also might have back-end engineers who want to work on that implementation focus as well. So virtualization and kind of advanced mocking is such a key uh, focus when we talk about the lifecycle thing. And we'll, um, we'll focus on that today as well. Uh, also generating code, being able to generate specific clients in terms of SDKs, and then also server stubs, and then also being able to run uh, tests against that um, definition as well. So making sure that we have a stub, we can go ahead and generate a response in terms of a, a static response, but also maybe applying that to you know the virtual API where we can make that more dynamic, and we'll dive into that in a bit more detail as part of the session today. Okay, so what are we talking about a, a smart bear API lifecycle workflow um, when we talk about what I'll be kind of focusing on as part of today? So we'll take our uh, definition driven approach and you might have heard of the Swagger tooling um, in, 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 in the past. So we'll look at designing from an API perspective. Uh, don't worry, it won't be Swagger Pet Store because I think a lot of people uh, have been um, working through that this week and yeah, a couple of people have commented on the booth that you know we'd like to see something else. So we'll look at a, a H4, H4 or a, a, sorry, a, a book based um, API design, uh, bookstore based API design, and then we'll look at it going ahead and uh, creating a virtualization uh, with that as well. So being able to virtualize based on the definition, being able to refactor that, making any changes, and then also making that API uh, as dynamic as possible. We'll also then look at from a testing perspective. So how can we go ahead and apply tests against a static response or it's a virtual um, API response, static or dynamic, and then we'll uh, achieve that using the you know, SOAP UI tooling. And then also being able to monitor the API as well. So something that is extremely important is when we talk about kind of post-production or kind of going into this DevOps world, uh, we want to be able to monitor the API in terms of performance and availability on a 24 by seven basis. Do we want to understand issues uh, and before our customers essentially, and then have that applied to a kind of a CI CD process as well. So this will be kind of pretty much the flow in terms of uh, what we'll be covering today. Okay, so that's pretty much the slides. Just wanted to take five minutes to uh, dive into that. And again, hopefully you can see my screen, I believe on my other screen, it should be okay. Okay, great. So wanted to firstly talk a bit about um, API design and working with open API uh, specification, um, being able to apply Swagger tooling to working through a collaborative environment. Again, that's what the session is really entailing today is being able to collaborate, keeping multiple parties um, included in working across the API lifecycle. So in terms of this solution, uh, we're gonna be just using the uh, creation of an API from a design first perspective uh, using Swagger Hub. And then we're gonna take that particular definition and then move it to a virtualization environment. We're gonna go ahead and start to run a test against that. And then we're gonna go ahead and build a, a monitor to make sure that this is available 24 by seven. And we'll look at some areas across the way, such as uh, you know refactoring and also data-driven approaches, uh, being able to change different data sets based off what we have defined inside of our spec. So what we can also apply in terms of API design, especially when we have multiple people working together, is also standardization. So what I mean by standardization is essentially applying a style guide to make sure that there's consistency And when we talk about design. Now you might see here that we have this particular uh, dropdown that says uh, standardization. This allows me to filter based on some of the APIs that I have and my colleagues are collaborating on as part of my Smartware APAC 
um, organization that I have here. And I can filter to say, you know, where are these errors? How many of my APIs currently have errors associated with them? And these errors are not based on something that's actually failing. It's based on the style guide not being met in certain criteria. So let's just take a look at that before we dive in any further, because it is going to be an important part uh, today. So we have our organization structure underneath SmartBare APAC. I can set up teams from here in terms of API architects, API consumers, developers, documentation, um, team members, and also governance. So if we wanted to share that API design outside of um, the norm, I mean, we have our internal teams. We also may have external teams. You can go ahead and add in different team members and share across via a link, or if you can you know, share um, the actual uh, JSON or YAML file with them as well. But when we talk about standardization, it's creating that style guide. So here we can enable standardization for all of the APIs, not just one individual. And before we can actually publish the API documentation, we can go ahead and require all of the APIs to be able to make sure that all of these rules um, have been followed. Now, what I mean about rules is, you know, API info, um, API operations and models, you know, API license must be present and on empty string. Um, API contract must be present on an empty string. And then something like, you know, all model properties must have examples. Now, these are fine from an out of the box perspective, but when we talk about industry to industry, there might be specific style guides that are applicable to each. We look at open banking, we look at manufacturing, we look at all these other areas. There may be specific style guides that are applicable to each industry and also each team, each organization. So that's why we also have the support for custom rules. I can go ahead and create a custom rule to say that the OAS version uh, must be 3.0. I can go ahead and edit this particular rule. I can specify my path, and then I can specify any particular regex in that case as well. Now, if I wanted to try this and make sure that it's correct, I can import an API. I can choose an example. Let's just select one of these guys. And then I can choose one of my versions. I can import and then I can see if I'm going to return that error from here as well. Now you can see that we're returning an error because we've actually specified that this is 2.0, but it's actually showing us that it's uh, OAS 3 in that case as well. So again, a very basic example, but when we're talking about collaboration, we really want to focus on keeping that consistency and also making sure that each of these rules uh, are applied. So again, always interested to know, you know how important is standardization in your organization? Uh, is it something that you guys do um, all the time? So again, keep us uh, keep us posted on the chat. Okay, so without further ado, again, I'm conscious of time, of course, uh, for this session. So I want to focus on creating a new API and I can create that new API from here. And we're just gonna create a blank slate. Um, in this case, we are gonna use Swagger 2.0. I know majority of people will use OS 3. We are not going to use Swagger Pet Store because it's, I think, used too much. We're gonna go ahead and use blank template and we're just gonna call this um, API Days uh, Workshop. And we'll call it version 0.1. And we're just going to actually go paste a lot of this in, but I just want to um, create a example that is different from others. Okay, we're going to choose where we're going to sit this. It could be in my individual uh, user, or it could be through my organization, which is a a number of different APIs that we have. We can assign this to a project as well. So if we wanted to assign this to a particular project uh, where only certain people have access to, we can point it to one of these. And then we can choose the visibility to be private or public. So if it's public, that is, you know, can be seen on, on swagger or app.swaggerhub.com. Um, if it's private, only the people inside of your organization can see it. We also have the ability to add in a um, auto mock, which allows us to create that mock like I talked about earlier uh, to be able to test against you know, static responses that we have defined inside of our spec. So if we go ahead and create this API, this will give us our editor view and our blank canvas. And you can see here that this will give us our initial phase. Now, I'm just going to, um, for the interest, interest of time, I am just going to paste in something that I've prepared already. Um, and we should see we have our bookstore in this case as well. So we have our SmartBear library. This has a number of different GET requests in this case. Again, it could be GET, could be POST, could be PUT, et cetera. But just for the purpose of today's session and something a small bit different from um, the Swagger Pet Store, we're just going to use a, a library uh, today. 
Okay, so we'll just go ahead and save that. And you can see here that we have um, our information in terms of our version, in terms of our description. We have a couple of different paths. In this case, we're returning certain books, we're returning certain authors, and we're also returning um, um, author IDs and, and all, that, all that information from here as well. We can have our quick search over here on the left-hand side, and then we all have our interactive documentation over here on the right, and then we have some auto mocking capabilities uh, that we've added in towards the end as well. So we have an auto mock that we can use to return a specific curl command, or we can go ahead and use a, a I suppose a virtual endpoint uh, that we can hand off to our front end developers, we can hand off to our testers, and they can test against what we have defined inside of our spec. Okay. So if we look at uh, this particular get books search, here we can return a specific um, ID if we use the try it out function. I'll type in um, Game of Thrones. And then we can go ahead and execute. And then this will give us our specific response, but it also gives us this particular curl command and this request uh, URL. So let's just take the request URL here and just approve. If we go to another tab, Blocking that as well, just one second. Here we go. My camera is in front of me, so it is <laughs> blocking me. So if we paste that, then this will return us our response here in terms of the browser. Okay, so we have our um, virtual endpoint. We can hand this off to our developers. We can hand this off to our testers just to va validate that we have that static response. We also see our headers uh, for each of these as well. And we also have a request duration, but it's not always just 200 okay. We also maybe want to return some 404 messages as well um, that we have defined inside of our spec. So this makes it a lot easier to be able to, you know, live and interact lively with the particular um, live documentation and what we've actually designed in terms of the API. And again, it's all about collaboration in terms of what we're discussing today. Now, when we talk about collaboration, if myself and my colleagues are working on this particular um, editor view together, we can go ahead and add in comments. So we'll just say I'm adding in a new path or I'm changing a path on, on line six. So I can go ahead and say, you know, changing line six of the spec and we can add in a comment from here. So this means that everyone who's working on this API together will get a message or an email notification to say that uh, Martin has made a change in terms of line six of the spec. And if we can use this also from a from an error handling perspective or you know resolving issues, um, I can go ahead and resolve the comment from here. We select on our drop down, and we'll be able to see any changes. So it, it just makes it a lot easier than working from a, an email perspective and you know other um, kind of communication when we have it inside of a platform. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. We actually ran a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago. Um, when we talked about our uh, state of API reports that we run every year at SmartBear to get feedback from the community. And um, there was such a difference in terms of you know 2016 when I um, had started working with SmartBear and we did this first initial webinar with the state of testing, uh, API testing, and then also um, for 2020 and you know how popular email was back then to how unpopular it is uh, right now when you talk about the likes of you know MS Teams and Slack and, and all these different um, applications that are there, but also having inbuilt uh, communication in the likes of Git, uh, Hub, and also inside of uh, tools like here as well. Okay, cool. So look, let's jump back in here and we'll talk a bit about versioning. So when we're talking about versioning of the API, we may want to go ahead and add in new versions and keep it consistent, of course. So I can add in a new version called 0 0.2 here um, as an example, and I can keep this as the default version and I can also uh, create the version from here as well. Now, why this is important is if we're making changes version to version, we may want to go ahead and compare and merge. So here I can go ahead and compare the versions and I can merge the versions from here as well. So I can compare any particular new paths that have been added and I can just select on here and this will automatically merge um, the update from here as well. But it's not just from comparing, comparing and merging that this is important, it's also important when we talk about um, integrations with other particular um, I suppose, areas of um, API management and also API gateways, um, as well as source control. So on here, we can select integrations. And we'll just take an example of pointing this particular um, YAML or JSON um, in terms of definition, or from a code generation perspective, to a GitHub instance. 
So we can take this documentation, um, we can take our YAML, we can take our JSON in terms of the definition, and we can point that to um, Amazon API gateways to keep it in sync, API management solutions, but also um, GitHub, GitLab, and also IBM API Connect. So let's just take an example here with GitHub Sync. This would allow us to synchronize um, once we connect, we'll just call this uh, workshop. And we'll connect to our GitHub using our authentication token. Now we're gone ahead and pass it through the token. We'll select our repository owner, which is me. And then we'll select our repository. In this case, we'll just select Swagger Hub integration. And then this is gonna say, okay, we are connected to your GitHub instance. What way do you want to go ahead and synchronize? Do we want to do this from a basic perspective or an advanced perspective? So in very simple terms, a basic is where we go ahead and use the Swagger Hub branch. Advanced lets you use your own branch in that case as well. We'll keep it basic for the moment. And then you can see here that we have our generated code. We can go ahead and sync the YAML. We can sync the JSON. We can sync specific client um, uh, SDKs and also server stubs. So if you're working with Node, if you're working with Spring, if you're working with JavaScript, Python, Objective-C, Swift, even supporting now Swift 5, uh, you can easily go ahead and sync. So let's just take an example of the JSON and we'll go ahead then see the output folder. We have our swagger.json as the output file. When we create and execute, this will go ahead and then um, start that synchronization from here as well. Okay, we'll select done and then we'll jump into our Git, selecting that Swagger Hub rep repo. And then you can see here that we had a recent push less than a minute ago. If we select on our particular branch for Swagger Hub, we'll be able to see our um, JSON resolved definition that we can carry over from here. If we look at our swagger.json file, now we can see this um, that Swagger Hub has updated and transferred this directly by Swagger Hub. Okay, so it's as simple as that. Um, with the uh, GitHub Enterprise, we can also do a synchronization uh, two-way, so back directly to Swagger Hub as well. So that's something that we've just added in uh, quite recently. Okay, so when we talk about um, the collaboration side of things, the next phase is gonna be talking about um, taking this particular uh, definition and then moving it to create a virtual uh, API go ahead and test against it, go ahead and create a monitor based on this as well. So let's go ahead and just firstly show where we can share. We can share and collaborate. We can hand off a link to our colleagues. We can invite team members such as, you know, API architects, API consumers to collaborate against this API. They can view, comment, or edit on that API as well. But if we wanted to go ahead and connect to the actual platform, we can download the um, client SDKs over here underneath export. We can download the server stubs. We can also look at the docu documentation in a HTML or CWiki perspective, and we can also download the API in terms of a JSON um, or YAML format. But what I wanna do is jump into another solution here, uh, which is called Ready API. Ready API is built for API readiness, essentially. Um, and it is essentially the controller behind um, SOAP UI, if you're familiar with that in the past. But what this allows us to do is uh, connect directly to Swagger Hub and take that um, API definition that we've uh, created, import it into this platform, and then build a virtual API, build a functional test, build a security test, build a load test against this as well. Okay, so if we go to projects here and we select new project, this will allow us to integrate and point to uh, you know, an API blueprint definition, uh, Postman collection if you have one, and then also uh, a Swagger Hub. So what we wanna do is be able to connect to that particular API that we just created. So I'm gonna search based on my account, and then we're gonna see all of the different um, APIs that we have. If we select my APIs, let's just see what we have here. And we're gonna search for that API. Smurper library, just gonna check the name. Yeah, I think this is the one that we're looking for, 0 0.1. Okay, so if we go ahead and select that, this will import the definition. You can see this loading up the definition. And then over on the left-hand side, we have all of our resources here, such as books, book ID, authors, author ID, and subjects. And then we have all of our different resources and methods from here as well. If we look at this get request, 
you can see that our endpoint is actually this vertserver.swaggerhub.com. So it's actually a mock in behind it. Um, so you can see here that we also have our resource path, which will show us our version, which is 0 0.1, and then the fact that this is books. And if I go ahead and return here um, Game of Thrones again, as part of our request parameter, we should go ahead and get a response. Now you can see that we have Game of Thrones as our response, and we can also see the JSON for this as well. So we're hitting against the uh, stub, but this stub is static; it's not dynamic, and that's one thing that's you know a bit of a, a an initial factor when we talk about collaboration and also being able to stand up something that is production-like as possible. So what we wanted to be able to do um, in terms of use case is create something that's dynamic. So we may want to go ahead and point to more than one title uh, of Game of Thrones. We may want to point to Harry Potter or something like that, just as an example. Um, so if we jump back to our left-hand side here, we can select on our APIs, and then we can right-click, and we can publish to Swagger Hub. So we can actually write this back to Swagger Hub if we've made any changes. We can refactor the definition. I talked a bit about, about refactoring earlier. We point to the uh, definition URL or the local file, and then we can go ahead and create new requests and new methods, so any updates that have been uh, changed. We can also go ahead and update the definition. Okay, So if the definition has changed anyway, we can delete some custom resources, we can delete some custom parameters, we can add new methods to our virtual services, and again, we can specify our definition format if it's um, OpenAPI or if it's uh, Waddle in this case as well. Now, so the first phase in terms of this collaboration lifecycle that we're talking about is um, designing the API, taking that definition, and then now we're gonna build a virtual API from this. Now you may think, oh, it's, it's gonna take ages to uh, build a virtual API, but right, what we can do is just right click here um, on our library. And then let's just see. I can go ahead and Yeah, we can generate our virtual service or we can generate our test suite. So if we generate our virtual service, this is gonna take all of our resources and all of our different um, uh, methods. And it's gonna say, okay, do you wanna create a virtual service? And then where do you wanna create it? So I'm gonna point this to localhost port 8086 and I'm going to select okay. This is then gonna bring me to the phase of creating the virtual API. And again, it's all done from a GUI perspective. Uh, here we have our incoming requests, we have our outgoing responses. So if we look at our example of the book, we'll have a look at our um, response. And you can see that we have our Game of Thrones, we have our JSON, and then our response two will show me that 404. Now we can change the response layout from a 200 okay to a, you know, um, 400, 404, 500, et cetera. Um, but we can also add logic against this. There's no point having a response that doesn't have any logic behind it. If we look, work through this example as is, the dispatch side is basically gonna say, okay, when we point to localhost port 8086 forward slash um, this particular uh, resource path, it's just gonna go sequence one and then sequence two. It's just gonna go one, two. And again, we don't really want to you know, have that as such of a, a simple format. We want to add in a bit of logic to it. So what this allows us to do is firstly, make this more dynamic. And what I mean by that is we're actually going to add in a data source and work through different um, titles of books. And we're gonna change the values of this as well. So the way we can do that is by selecting a data source and then we can choose our data source. We can point from an Excel sheet or a file or a grid, or we can also, um, connect to a database, and we also have a built-in generator, a data generator from here as well. And I'm gonna use an Excel file, we're just gonna call it books. And then I'm gonna select this from my folder, underneath API days. And we can go ahead and specify the uh, properties from here as well. So I'm just gonna leave that blank for a second, and we're gonna choose the um, cell to start at A2 and I'll bring up the Excel in a, a small bit. And the way that we can go ahead and implement this as part of the, um, I'll just call this sheet one actually as well. The way that we can implement this as part of our response is by selecting data sources and then select down here, data source one. And instead of Game of Thrones, we want to create a more dynamic 
response from here as well. So I'm going to right click in between our commas here, select get data, and then we're going to point to our property, which is books. So what this will do is it will build us out a mock response, uh, which is going to take the property of books and then allow us to loop through different data sets from here as well. So we'll go ahead and jump back to our uh, response, and then we'll go ahead and add in a parameter. And we can change the, or I suppose add in uh, logic from here as well. So I can say, you know, if the uh, if the title is called something, then send the response for something as well. But what I want to firstly show is, let's point to localhost port 8086, and we'll take this particular um, resource path. Let's point it to here. Let's just copy that. Okay, and we're just going to jump back, and I'm just going to use this tool called uh, Swagger Inspector, kind of open open source tool. So let's just take our um, let's just make sure we have that consistent. Okay, uh, localhost port eight eighty six. And then we have forward slash smart bear API days workshop. And then if we had a specific query parameter, this would allow us to um, point to a specific value. So you may see a difference. And what is that difference? Our response here now is Harry Potter. And then if we go ahead and change it, uh, run it again, we see the Great Gatsby. If we go ahead and run it again, we see Lord of the Rings. And then we see Pride and Prejudice. I don't know, maybe people like that book. It's it's quite interesting. Um, and then also we see Harry Potter again. So this means that we can loop through all of these different data sets rather than having a static response. So when we talk about mocking against virtualization, really virtualization, I did mention it yesterday, virtualization is mimicking a real production system, something that is as close to production as possible, whereas we can change the behavior to make it slow, to make it fast. We can add in authentication authorization, and we can also be able to make a more dynamic-based um, service as well. So if I wanted to add in a query parameter to say, you know, if a book has a specific ID and then return that based on um, a specific uh, request value, uh, we can show that as well. So if I jump back into um, our um, virtual service, you can see here that I've sent five uh, requests. If you jump into our transaction log, you can actually see this information underneath our messages from here. We'll be able to see our responses for Harry Potter, The Great Gatsby, Lord of the Rings, Pride and Prejudice, and then also Harry Potter as well. So it means that we have that stub that's created, but that stub is also virtual. Now, what I talked about, about uh, making this more dynamic is by adding in a behavior setting. So I could change the server capacity to be extremely small. I could change the bandwidth to be you know, 10 megabits per second. Um, and I can change the latency and congestion to be you know, quite uh, changeable in terms of milliseconds, in terms of latency, and then congestion. I could also start sending error codes at certain points in time to be able to say, OK, what happens when we start getting 404s? Is, is it going to be is it going to be something that, that goes bad? I mean, do we want to start sending 500s to you know, repeat a, an internal server error? Um, what's going to happen in that case as well? Now, if we change the server capacity, we've added in 10% you know, congestion. Um, it may take a bit longer for us to get a response in terms of this particular uh, API call. You can see here, uh, the request has been terminated. Network error, the host is unreachable. So this means that we can go ahead and um, actually make this API call uh, fail or give us network performance issues to understand you know, what would happen in a real life like scenario. Um, so this is the beauty of creating a virtual API. Uh, you can change it as much as you want. You can go ahead and um, configure it in terms of connection bandwidth, as I mentioned, also congestion uh, to make sure that um, you can play around with a virtual API and uh, the transactions associated with it. Um, we can also add in auth, so you can change authorization. Maybe we're working with OAuth or uh, BASIC or NTLM. We can go ahead and specify our bearer header and apply that to um, the virtual API call. You may also want to add in assertions for validation on these specific responses. Uh, you can also add in assertions to validate the content and making sure that that is correct uh, as well. So you can easily change that particular value. Um, 
in terms of the view of the response from here, you can see that we have our Harry Potter. Um, you can see that we have our link, we have our published date. And again, we could change any of the values based on what we have defined inside of the response. If I go to edit um, the response again, we'll have a look at that JSON. I can change any of these values because it's not uh, it's not hard coded as well. I can you know, obviously view any of these details. I can add in specific responses. Um, I can change responses and I can add in a new response, response three. Maybe we want to go ahead and return a 500 um, from here as well. I can just choose from the list and then we'll choose a 500 from here as well. So I can apply logic to say, okay, what happens when we return a 500? Um, what happens when we return a 404? What happens when we return a 200? Am I going to get the response in that case as well? Now, it's not just limited to the definition. Um, I talked a bit yesterday about you know, what if an application is unavailable or not always available? What if you're working with a database, but you might not always have access to that database? Is it possible to virtualize it? Um, so you do have the options if we just stop this virtual service from here. Um, I talked a bit about the kind of Google Maps example yesterday, and it's definitely something I've run into in the past, is um, if you're running a load test against a live endpoint and there is limits associated with it, such as um, API calls per day, uh, transactions per day. We'll just say Google Maps as an example. Uh, hits per day. And again, if you're running a load test against it, uh, just as maybe your application is associated with Google Maps, we know mo so many mobile applications now have um, Google Maps as their kind of backend with these kind of rideshare applications and um, you know, food delivery applications as such. Uh, but if you wanted a test to make sure that you know the map is working and it can identify the location uh, of the the rider in this case. Um, you may want to be able to firstly see if it's functionally correct, and second of all, um, if I get a large peak, you know, maybe the when Melbourne went into lockdown for the first time, everyone started to order Uber Eats. Um, just as an example, you can go ahead and then run the load test against that. But what happens if we go ahead and hit that threshold very, very quickly? This limits our load testing. So what we can do in that case is actually route to the live um, endpoint, APIs.Google.com. Um, forward slash maps, and then forward slash to the location, as an example. And then this will allow us to capture the responses inside of our virtual API. And then we can route to, I suppose, collect all of the um, responses. And then we can store them inside of our virtual API. Then we can go ahead and change the values from here as well. So you know, maybe we're capturing Melbourne, but we also want to capture Sydney, Canberra, um, Perth, et cetera, and different longitudes, different latitudes. And we want to be able to loop through them as well. Then we have a scenario where we have enough infrastructure where we can actually run a virtual uh, load test or run a load test against a virtual service. And I've seen so many examples of this specifically for 2020. Uh, I'm not sure why the reason is um, straight away, but I mean, we're seeing a lot more interest in terms of running load tests against virtual APIs because we mightn't always have access to that production API uh, as well. So again, interested to see if you guys uh, run into the same scenario. Do you run? some sort of unit tests against mocks or you know maybe i'm talking to the, the wrong audience completely but i mean it's just examples of um where functional and load testing comes in uh, but again it's not always about testing as well when we're talking about this virtual api we can hand this off to our front-end developers um as well so they can start developing against once we can return responses um responses that are dynamic like i mentioned in terms of here uh, we can also go ahead and see different outputs based on logic that we've added in. So if we have credit card information or account information based on a uh, on an open banking API, um, we can go ahead and test all scenarios. We can develop against all scenarios because we have um, the ability to uh, work at this across our local host uh, because it's a virtual API. Now, you may say to me, and it's definitely something that's come across multiple times, it's on your local host. Look, we're not really going to be sharing this. It's not collaborative. So your session today was more around collaboration. Completely agree. Um, the way that we work around this is using what we call Vert Server. Okay, so Vert Server is actually running on my machine at the moment. Um, it'll actually, uh, but I have to sign into it in a second. But basically, we have our local virtual service. We have our virtual virtual service from here. It's running on my machine. Uh, you can see it actually running from here server. So this essentially allows you to go ahead and deploy this virtual server across any infrastructure inside of your organization. It sits on an IP address. And now my IP address is essentially my endpoint. 
Okay, so this means that I can share the, the virtual service that I've created locally across teams, making sure that our developers can develop. They're not focused on just my local host. Obviously, if they have the ability to point to the local host, they can use it that way. But the way to, I suppose, collaborate and share across the API is by using a, a virtual server as well. So we'll jump back to that in, in a couple of minutes um, just to, to verify what that is as well. Um, but what I talked about earlier you know, is, I suppose, changing the values, having a, um, a virtual API that allows you to change responses. We talked a bit about the, you know, the mocked um, responses with the books. We can see that we have um, an hour refresh. We're not sending or receiving any responses. If I jump back to where I pointed to this local uh, host, and then if we receive it again, um, this again will have, um, it's gonna return us an error because we have the error set from it as well. But we saw earlier, if we look at our history, uh, we'll see some of the examples of us where we've pointed to that, this particular um, virtual API in this case as well, okay? So keep the questions coming, guys. Uh, definitely interested in uh, your information. Um, but if I actually run this again, let's see if we, let's see if we get a response this time. Okay, well, let's jump back. Maybe I need to change something in terms of my behavior. Unlimited, uh, large, and then our setup should be okay. Let's see if, if it's not gonna work this time. We did see it working already. Uh, Localhost 8086. Okay, so unauthorized for getting in that case as well. I think the reason I'm unauthorized is because I've added in a auth in this case as well. So if we change that to none, we should jump back and then we should be able to get a response from here as well. Okay, so now you can see we have our Harry Potter. We can see this is gonna give us a 404, which is our second response. This is gonna give us no response. This is gonna give us our Great Gatsby, which is again dynamic, gonna give us our 404 and then we can loop through. Now, why do you think the reason for that is, is because our virtual API is now three responses. One, two, three, three is 500. Two is 404, we have a status message, and then our response one is our dynamic um, with our mocked response from here as well. So this is actually a good example that I was able to show that we can go from <laughs> unauthorized in terms of uh, this setting to being able to send um, responses with the 401 and also a 200 with our uh, responses in terms of that JSON format as well. Um, so just a, a couple of quick examples uh, from here as well. Okay, so again, just conscious of time, guys. Um, now, when we're talking about the virtual service, we may want to apply that to you know working inside of something like you know, Postman, SOAP UI. Um, you can also see that we have the Swagger Inspector from here as well. And this is just, again, an open source solution, inspector.swagger.io. Um, so definitely check it out. It's just like a, a quick check tool, very similar to Postman. Um, it allows you to go ahead and you know uh, send a request, um, add in authentication. You can see here that we do select um, basic and OAuth and JWT. And you can actually build a definition from this and then apply it to, to Swagger Hub as well. But yeah, definitely check it out. It's, it's open source. Um, okay, so if we jump back into where we were, we have our virtual API. And now we can go ahead and then generate a test suite from here if we want as well. So I can generate a test suite, create a test case for each resource or a single test case for each of these as well. And then I can go ahead and we can see we have different test cases for each individual item. If we go ahead here, we see that our virtual um, our, our vert server is our mock. This is our static mock. Um, and we can actually change this to localhost port 86. So let's actually see the two examples. One, Game of Thrones when we use a parameter. And we can see that we have our uh, title that we've provided from here. If I change this to localhost port 8086, send a response, uh, this is gonna give us the 404. Then this is gonna give us our different data sets from here. So this is how easy we can change from a, a real server to a virtual server. Um, but if we go back to this example here, when we pass through the parameter, we can actually uh, create an assertion so we can validate data. So what I can do is right click and then add an assertion for content. I can validate that Game of Thrones is correct. And now this will allow us to make sure that this is a real 
test. It's something that's uh, correct. And again, when we're validating something like this from a definition, we're talking about collaboration. So we're, we have a team working on the development side. We have a team working on the front end side. We have a team working on the testing side. So we're keeping it all together in terms of that parallel development path. I can also validate items like a 200 OK or a HTTP status code. I can right click here and I can create something for existence. We'll just make sure that this JSON path expression is correct. But I can also validate a status code. So when I select on assertions down here, I can validate something like a Swagger uh, compliance assertion to validate that the request and response messages are compliant with the Swagger definition. And we'll just say that I want to validate a 200 OK as well. Now, an example of this is was working with um, a customer a couple of weeks ago. and we ran a couple of um, load tests and then we wanted to validate uh, why there was a 457 uh, appearing um, and we wanted to make sure that we were getting a 200. And it was a certain point in time where after the load test hit, I think 50 users um, in terms of virtual users, that it was going from 200s to 457s uh, in terms of too many requests had been hit. So what we ended up understanding was that there was another team offshore that were actually running some security testing um, at the same time. So it's just an easy way to understand that when we use these assertions for validation, because at the end of the day, a 200 OK is just not enough. We need to validate that the content of that response body uh, is also valid as well. So we just need to uh, bear that in mind. Now, if we take our test case here, and then if we right click, we can then create a security test. And again, security testing is something that is not always taken into account that much. We have the top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities here that I can go ahead and create a security scan against. And then this will allow me to take the uh, test case. Again, this is all based off a of Swagger definition, open API definition. And I can run my uh, security test against this as well. So I can use the likes of SQL injections, XPath injections, fuzzing scanning, and then boundary scanning. And then I can also right click in that test case and I can create a load test from here as well. So again, we're talking about the API lifecycle from a design first perspective. We don't even have a fully built API here. We're just using the definition. We're using the design first perspective. This is all based off a of virtual API, but we're allowing to create security tests. We're allowing to create a load test against this as well. Also creating assertions based on performance uh, from here as well. Okay, now this is all again automated. It's not based on just um, the functional testing piece. Um, and we can right click on our project, Swagger Hub project, and then we can go ahead and launch our test runner. This allows us to specify properties in terms, our arguments, our properties, in terms of the test suite, in terms of the test case that we want to execute. And then we can launch a command. I'm just going to save that to my machine. And here we can see that we have our test runner.bat. I can go ahead and execute that in terms of an automated uh, test across not only functional, but also load and um, performance and security as well. Okay, so that's talking a bit about the virtual API and then how we can kind of factor in the uh, lifecycle side of things. The next phase is taking this particular virtual API or this endpoint and then building a monitor against it because what's more important monitoring the API in terms of functionality, performance, and I suppose availability are your customers coming to you and say, look, we're not getting responses. Your API is down. Uh, your consumers are complaining. You want to understand if there's an issue before your customers do. So what we can do in that case is we have the ability to select a, an API monitor from here. I can see some of the monitors that I've already created. In this case, if I want to add a new monitor, um, I can easily go ahead and do that uh, as well. And I'll jump into that in a moment. You can select Add Monitor. We can choose our project. We can choose our test suite. We can choose our test cases. And then we can go ahead and give the monitor a name. We can choose um, when we want this to be monitored. Is it every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, et cetera? But I'm going to jump into this in another way because we're really focusing on Open API today. Okay. So if we jump into my browser as well, and we jump into alert site UXM. This is our nice, clean, cool dashboard. Even showed the, the dark view today. Um, make it nice and easy to, to understand. So what this allows us to do is see different websites, different um, applications, both mobile, web, and API um, being monitored um, throughout the 
throughout the world. Essentially, we have over 100 different nodes that you can use. Now, what I want to look at is our library OAS monitor. Now, our library OAS monitor is located over here. Um, I've had this running since uh, last night. It was just something I, I wanted to show and have prepared because we are monitoring this every five minutes. And obviously, with time, I just wanted to make sure we had something prepared. Now, what this will show me is the last runtime of this particular uh, monitor. You may ask, what is this built on? This is built on a that vert, uh, vert server dot, um, swaggerhub.com, which is the virtual static endpoint. I could also build this off that IP address that I talked about earlier as well. So I have my 1.19 seconds every five minutes. That's how long it's taking. We see a historic performance between September 15th and September 16th, and we see the availability. So it's been 100% available. I've added in a note to say to my team that this is uh, for API days, um, and it was Martin who created it from the Melbourne team. And then I can also um, add in alerts to make sure that I'm notified if the API goes down. You can see here that we're monitoring some um, iPhone SE monitors for looking at some other API calls, and we have uh, alerting set up across these. This is something that SmartBear use internally as well when we're actually building our applications. Uh, we want to monitor them and make sure that um, we are aware of any issues before our customers are. But if I jump into the actual monitor itself and we look at a quick view, <clears throat> this will give us uh, information based on the monitor in terms of performance, uh, availability. You can see that particular call. It's on the IP address and then the response time, DNS time, first byte time, connection time as well. And we can also see um, more in-depth information as well if we wanted to dive in from here. We can look at the run view. Now, this is more applicable to uh, web-based testing. When we're talking about a, a full transaction, we'll just say if we're using an e-commerce system, uh, logging in, shopping, cart, purchasing a product and logging out, this talks about all of the different aspects associated with that. So it's not just for API testing, but I suppose the purpose of what I wanted to show today is more related to API testing and API standing up of the um, availability and performance. So if we jump back into this monitor and we go view monitor details, this will dive us into more specifics about our response time, our availability, the steps, and then any specific domains. In this case, swaggerhub.com is our domain. Um, we can see any performance uh, degradation uh, over the last 24 hours, and then how long our responses are taking over uh, that period of time. Again, we have four different response calls, and then we can see the availability um, over the last um, number of uh, times as well. Our last run was 1.35 AM. Again, this is Eastern time, I believe. Um, so. That's probably need to change that myself. But we can look at this over the last 24 hours, the last seven days, or the last 30 days as well. Um, really easy to understand. If we selected some other monitors, this will show us a kind of a, a cumulative uh, view across multiple monitors and across the different locations as well. So you know we've pretty much redesigned this whole platform in terms of making it visually easy. So where this comes in as a kind of a use case is, you may have a front end, back end. Um, you may you may want to look at it that way. You may have an external API, you may have an internal API. So you can monitor from an internal perspective and also from an external perspective. So if you have a front end um, and then you have the back end API calls that you want to monitor, you want to be aware if either of these is having performance degradations or if it's, um, if it's down in terms of functionality, et cetera. So you may ask, what? about logs, what about alerting, how do we get that information? So we can see that we have our summary view, we have some charts that we can go ahead and define. Uh, we can filter based on hour, by day, by location. So if we filter by location from here, this will show us all the different locations that we're monitoring from, San Francisco, Texas, Dublin, Ireland, uh, Birmingham, Singapore, and then Sydney, as well as Perth. And then we can look at the number of runs over the last 24 hours as well. So what, what runs have we had? What has the performance been like across each of these locations as well? So let's take Perth as an example. Uh, first byte time, uh, Sydney. Yeah, some differences between the current and the baseline. Again, it's a virtual API. So it's just an example in terms of what I wanted to show today. And then about um, alerting. So what type of alerts can we uh, receive? So we have different alerts that you can set up. It's very easy to set up a recipient. I can choose my um, selection here. I'm getting email in terms of text format. I can go ahead then and edit my recipient details. Um, the availability alerts are enabled. 
I can go ahead and attach the server response. I can notif be notified when the error is cleared. And then I can go ahead and receive only warnings or errors in this case as well. So if I go ahead and save that, I can also choose a number of different methods. So uh, Splunk, PagerDuty, um, SMS, email, et cetera, as well. Okay. So what we're really focusing on in terms of that kind of lifecycle view is um, being able to create a monitor based on an API. Now, jumping back a step, how do we create this monitor? If we go to add and then create new monitor, here we can select this based on a manual, um, a manual creation. If we have open API, we can select that from here. So if we have open API, let's go ahead and select from a local file that we have, select API days, we should have swagger.json. And now you can see I can create an authentication type um, such as username and password, but basic. We also support OAuth um, and JWT. So I'm just gonna select none for the moment. And then we can select um, our different examples of our endpoints. So you may have seen this inside of our uh, Ready API. So we have books, book ID, authors, author as ID, and then subjects. And again, you can see the same from here as well. So this is basically saying, what ones do you want to add? So we'll just add books for the moment. And if we wanted to add in something like authors as well, we could go ahead and do that as well. So these are our endpoints. We can edit the parameters across each of these, select next. And then if we wanted to return a particular uh, response, so for our books, let's select title again. I believe it's capital T. Let's just verify. Do, do, do. Yeah, so title. And then Game of Thrones. And then if we go ahead and validate that step, we'll get our response here in terms of that JSON um, and we'll be able to see our Game of Thrones. Now, again, this is our virtual service. We could also monitor that based on that IP address like I talked about. We can also add in assertions based on the status code, um, based on the response in terms of JSON, where we want to go ahead and add in a property. So we'll just say that our um, title is going to be equaling um, Game of Thrones. And now we've gone ahead and added in an assertion for here as well. So this means that when we're monitoring the API or when the uh, monitor is monitoring this particular API, that it's always going to check if this content is valid uh, from here as well. So we'll validate that step, make sure that it's correct. Our assertion is valid in this case as well. And then we can go ahead and create our monitor from here as well. Now we have over 100 nodes across the world. You can choose the monitor um, in terms of the locations. We can select um, Australia. And you can see here we have Brisbane, Perth, Sydney, and we can also change Ireland because I'm from Ireland and we have Dublin. And then we'll also look at maybe, um, let's select Singapore. And now we have Singapore. So this is allowing us to monitor this API call uh, every five minutes. Now, when we talk about API calls and especially um, very common APIs, you're gonna be talking about transactions every couple of seconds. So usually when we're talking about intervals, we're usually talking about you know one minute, two minutes in that case as well. Um, so when we talk about modes, we have a couple of different modes, uh, global notify, global verify, round robin. So global verify, which is the default, essentially it will check from a location such as um, Sydney and Brisbane, we'll take as an example. It's gonna check Brisbane to make sure that the API call is valid but we want to make sure that there's no false positives. So we can also then check a couple of minutes later from the nearest location, in this case, which is Sydney. So it's actually checking to verify that the API might be down in a similar region uh, from here as well, okay? So this is just an example in terms of creating monitors. When we select start monitoring now, let's actually select this for two minutes. Create monitor now, we'll just give this a name, API days monitor and then select start monitoring now this is going to save our monitor and then it will take about two two minutes just to start collecting data we should see it towards the bottom of the screen and da -da -da -da. yeah api days monitor you can see it down here so this will just take two minutes to collect that data and then we're have we have our um we have our 
monitor up and running in that case as well. Okay, cool. So we'll jump back to that in a second. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of what I wanted to cover today, guys, in terms of the workshop. So we talked a bit about the collaboration across the API lifecycle in terms of taking our definition, designing it in terms of the Swagger tooling, um, being able to collaborate and share that, work across versions, and also be able to, um, I suppose, synchronize this to source control systems such as GitHub, be able to download this particular definition, create a virtual API from that in a couple of seconds, and make that virtual API dynamic, validate uh, if we're getting responses and different responses at that, and then also add in assertions and then run tests against it, uh, make it into a negative and make it into a, a positive test, and then also be able to um, create a monitor based on that in terms of the API lifecycle. Now, if you obviously wanted to go ahead and you know have this as part of a CI/CD process as well, um, all of the solutions here at Smartware, um, open source and professional, um, have connections to um, the likes of Jenkins and the likes of Bamboo and the likes of Team City, Azure DevOps. So you'd be able to have this as part of your API lifecycle in terms of that collaboration point of view as well. Okay, so we have about three minutes left. Um, I'm just going to open the floor up for uh, a couple of questions, if there is any. If there's not, uh, thank you for your time. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions, guys. So um, yeah, thanks very much for your for your time today. Um, hopefully the session was of value. Um, yeah, thanks very much for attending. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can uh, reach out to me um, on uh, martin.mcdonough at smartware.com. Um, is, is there an integration suite of products under one umbrella, or do we have to switch between them? Um, it's, it's, it's all part of, um, as a, like you, you can go ahead and tailor it in terms of the way that it works, in terms of the umbrella of, of solutions. Uh, we can really filter that uh, and make it as, um, I suppose as approachable as uh, under an umbrella as possible. So I mean, the Swagger Hub tool is a separate solution. The Ready API is a separate solution on the uh, alert site. But again, it is something that can be bundled together if there's interest. So I mean, we can reach out um, if you are interested. Um, we see customers that go in the individual space as well as the kind of umbrella as well. Um, I think the main thing that we're talking about here is keeping consistency. So making sure that you know it's as easy to import a definition, create that virtual API, create that test, and create that monitor um, all together in a very fluid process as well. Um, I mean, for the example that I kind of worked through from there, it wasn't t too difficult. It just you know we're using something other than Swagger Pet Store for sure, which is uh, definitely the feedback that we got. But I mean, it's all relevant when we talk about the API lifecycle. Okay, we're talking about. Um, the definition definition driven approach but also that parallel development approach as well making sure that you know teams can work fluidly and work at their own time um as well okay so hopefully that answers your question um again if you are um it, it is all individual uh, individually licensed apart from the the ready api platform so the platform with the virtualization um the testing and the load testing together that is all underneath one bundle but as i mentioned um the team here can uh, spin up something that could be underneath the same umbrella uh, if it's something that would be interested uh, of interest to you as well so i mean that's something that we could uh, um yeah talk to you about offline okay so guys uh, just at the uh the time so thanks very much for your time today guys